Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can come into your house, O oh God, and offer you tithes and offerings, Lord, giving our best to you, Lord. And we thank you for that, Lord. Bless those that give, Lord. Bless the offerings that come into this church to sustain the church, sustain the building, and to continue to sustain the ministry. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you look at your bulletin, you should have uh, the boys gave you, the ushers gave you a handout. And uh, I have a, an actual picture that was taken at the Tower of Babel there to give you the size and parameters and uh, give you a look of what it probably looked like. It was, you know, that's a complete picture, of course, uh, and the Tower of Babel was never completed. But this is what it would have looked like had it been completed. Now, how do we know that? Well, the difficulty with some of these sermons that I'm preparing is that they're historical and they're Old Testament. There's not a lot of theology in these sermons, so we try to find theology when we can or find lessons when we can. I came across uh, this quote, and I want to read this to you, uh, as it relates to the Tower of Babel. Yes, it did exist. Yes, they tried to build this magnificent tower, and yes, God frustrated them. So we'll talk about that uh, today, probably today and next week. It says this. This is the quote. Although we may encounter this story in Sunday school, we don't often hear about it from the pulpit or in our morning devotionals. But we can often see ourselves in the narrative, especially today. It's important that Christians take an introspective look for the telltale signs of this kind of sin within their lives and within the church. So we'll, we'll get to that later. But if you can see, the Tower of Babel is technically, from what I understand from reading and doing a little bit of research on this, is that it would have been the largest brick structure ever made by mankind. Now, what do I mean by that? There are larger buildings, of course, and if you turn to the back of this handout, you'll see the largest buildings in all the world and how big and how uh, great man is able to build these uh, tremendous architectural structures. And then you see all the way to the right, the Great Pyramid. Now, this, this Tower of Babel, this Babylonian to tower, would have been about 300 feet tall, 300 feet wide, and about about twice the size of a football field, so it was a very large structure. Now, you would think that 300 feet is not that big of a structure, but you're talking about 4,000 years ago or so, and, and then building this brick by brick. You know, this building is a brick building, and you can see the, the bricks are maybe six inches, you know, six inches long, and so that many bricks to build something that big would be, uh, would be tremendous. Uh, not only in that day, but also in today's day. And it would be the largest brick structure that has ever been made. Now, the Tower of Babel, if you look on the front page of this, says, and I'm learning you a little bit of history here, right? We're back to history class. Ancients believed that deities dwelt on high places and associated the gods with hills and mountains. I wonder where they got that from, right? Babylon was on a low ground. And the ziggurat, this is what it's called, the ziggurat, was a substitute mountain. It towered above the dust in the lower air and was an excellent place to observe the stars. From the ziggurat's top, heaven seemed closer. So they can be closer to their gods. Whatever, and we know that the Babylonians have, you know, thousands of different gods. So this is what they were trying to accomplish uh, in this, this tower of confusion or this tower of Babel. Now, let me give you a little bit of introduction, a little bit of background. I don't know uh, if I'll be able to finish this this week. I probably won't. I'll probably flow into next week because there's some lessons to be learned with the Tower of Battle, Babel. But we know that Adam and Eve were to instructed to be fruitful and multiply. You've always heard that. Be fruitful and multiply. If you're a good Catholic, right, be fruitful and multiply. Have many kids, you know, have many children so they can be Catholic and they can support the church. And, uh, and the Jews are much like that. Be fruitful and multiply. A lot of little Orthodox Jewish children running around Lakewood, right? I mean, this was something, this was a directive that God gave his people. In fact, it was a dominion mandate to go and populate the earth. We were instructed to do this. Unfortunately, uh, sin began in the Garden of Eden and continued on for about a thousand years until God saw creation and he decided to purge humanity, purge the sin out of humanity, and we of course know what happened. God decided to purge humanity with a worldwide flood and this flood would cleanse the earth and only one man, his family, and the animals would be spared. And we know from Genesis chapter 5, it says, Noah was righteous, was a righteous man, blameless, 
among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, uh, and they all survived. Now, would you like to be referred to as righteous in your, uh, you know, righteous in your time, right? We, we're, we're living in a time now where there's a lot of unrighteousness, there's a lot of sin, there's a lot of corruption, and you, you wonder, where are people's relationship with God? I know I want to be much like Noah, not everything like Noah, but Noah was righteous in God's eyes, and Noah was the only righteous uh, man in all the world, he and his family, and God, of course, spared him. So the flood happens, we read about the flood, we read about the ark, and then even after God wiped out the flood and all uh, of all of humanity with the flood, wickedness still was on the earth because of original sin. Sin had been inherited from Adam and Eve, and it was corrupt, and Noah's descendants became corrupt. How surprising. It did not take long for Noah's descendants to be corrupt. A thousand years after the flood, this religious leader, this king, this Nimrod, who was the great grandson of Noah, came to power in Babylon, and he's the, he was the brains behind this, the Tower of Confusion, the Tower of Babel. He was one of the first great leaders in this post-flood uh, kingdom or time frame, and he began to establish these civilizations and these kingdoms. And uh, one was called Babel or Babylon, and he wanted to create this great, uh, this great tower. So, when we look to Scripture, let us kind of look to Scripture, and it's found in Genesis chapter 11. It's on the back of your bulletin. It's a very short story, uh, so we have to kind of analyze it carefully. But this is the story of the Tower of Babel, and really Babel means confusion. So by me naming the sermon the Tower of Confusion, it's consistent with it being the Tower of Babel. And it's found in Genesis 11, uh, verses 1 to 8. But let me turn to my uh, Bible just to see if I, I want to make sure that I uh, capture everything that I want to uh, read. Uh, it says this, Now the whole world uh, had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Sinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we will make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have began to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. See, this city that they were building, this was really rebellion and the pride of man to do their own thing. And then, of course, God stops and intervenes them, and then uh, we can trace all the diverse languages of the world to this portion of Scripture uh, in the Tower of Babel. You may ask, why do all these people speak different languages? Why does the world have so many languages? Well, if we believe Scripture and we believe the Bible, we can trace it back to Genesis 11 when God uh, confounded them and confused them with these particular languages. So we know that the people of you know what we believe was still alive when the Tower of Babel was being constructed. Uh, it, it may have been uh, 350 years after, uh, after some periods that we have in Scripture, so they were able to kind of track that. They, they don't know exactly how old Noah would have been, but they think that Noah was alive during the construction of the Tower of Babel because I think he lived till 950 years. So there was plenty of time for him to observe this and observe his grandson that probably uh, in all likelihood was not following and obeying God because why would he follow and obey God and then try to build a Tower of Babel to reach to the heavens and kind of outwit God uh, as, he, as some of the information that we have. But building this tower was a direct violation of the directives that God gave uh, to Noah. Uh, he said, populate the world. Go and populate the world. And so now we have, if you see this picture, that the world is being populated as God directed, but then they said, let's gather together and let's make this big tower so we can be together. That's contrary to what God had directed them to do. God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. 
not come back to a particular place and gather all your resources so you can be your own gods. So they were violating that directive already. But when we read this portion of scripture, many things stand out. I mean, I just made some notes and I'll share them with you. Is Genesis chapter 11, it's only a, a, a few verses, maybe like nine verses. Now the whole world had one language in common speech, so they had one language in common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain and they settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. So we know how this particular uh, tower was going to be built. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Now right away as we read this language, what I see there is come let us build ourselves a city. That looks like pride to me. Let's build ourselves a city. Let's see how prideful we can be. We can do all that we want to accomplish. Let's build this city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. So it's not just like let's build something. Let's not build a house so we can have shelter, but let's build a city for ourselves. First of all, they shouldn't be building it for themselves. They should be building everything and doing everything for God, right? I mean, we know that the, the Jews made these beautiful temples for God so they can worship God in these particular temples. This is devoid of anybody saying, let's build this great structure so we can have a place to gather together and worship the one true God. That's all uh, left out of this. That's not in the equation here. Let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. There's pride and there's idolatry so that we may make a name for ourselves. Where's God in all of this? How short a memory humanity has. Just a thousand years ago, or just a few years before that, the world was destroyed. And Noah was still alive to even tell them these things had occurred. And there were people alive from Noah's family that went through the flood. How, how short a memory we have. Now here's the interesting turn in this portion of scripture. But the Lord came down. Now that's really interesting language. That's Christological language. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that people were building. Now let me suggest to you that that is the pre-incarnate Christ. Now it doesn't say this in scripture, and I'm not telling you that this is uh, exactly and precisely what happened, but when I see words like that, but the Lord came down, that to me is a pre-incarnate Christ. Because we know through the incarnation, he came down, the second person of the Trinity, the Word, the Son of God, transitioned from heaven to earth. And he transitioned, and in that transition, he broke what we call the ontological divide. The ontological divide of the things of the Spirit and heaven and things of this world and earth. And he broke that divide. He became flesh and blood, was born to Mary in that little manger. And that's the incarnation, and that's what we celebrate as Christmas. But there's a lot of Christology and a lot of theology in that. So when I see the words, but the Lord came down, I believe that would be the pre-incarnate Christ. He came down to see the city and the tower and what the people were building. The Lord said, as if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. So I have some bad news for you. A lot of you believe, and a lot of people believe, aliens came to build the Great Pyramids. And it's very mysterious if you look on the Discovery Channel and you look at National Geographic, how did they build these Great Pyramids? Well, how did they build the Tower of Babel? The Lord confirms how they built the Tower of Babel. They put their collective minds together and built it together. And the Lord said there's nothing that they can't accomplish when they come together to build it. So don't be surprised if the pyramids were made by the same type of people that were building the Tower of Babel. So I don't want to break your bubble that the aliens coming down from the sky, Martians, and giving instructions on people how to build the, the pyramids. But many people believe that, and many Christians believe this. I won't get into Nephilim again. I'll leave that for another day. You guys can figure that out for yourselves. Verse 7. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. Well, who do you think is going to confuse the language? Crickets. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to confuse the language. So now we have a personification of the pre-incarnate Christ coming down to earth to see what they're doing. The second person of the Trinity. 
And they're going to confuse the language, which I believe is by the power of the Holy Spirit that they're going to confuse the language. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth. I believe that was God the Father. I think you could see the Trinity in the Tower of Babel. Now I may be reaching, but when I read this as a New Testament theologian, I see the Trinity fully operational, and it may in fact be interchangeable at some points. God is definitely behind the, the destruction or the confusion of the Tower of Babel. He frustrates the plans of man. He'll frustrate your plans if they're not in accordance with, with his will. Look, at when you love the Lord and you're going in one direction, he loves you enough to get you off that track, the wrong track, and get you on the right track. Now, these people didn't have any relationship with God. They were a God unto themselves, the Tower of much like how things are in the world today. Yes. Let's build a bigger structure. Yes. We can do more. Let's go to Mars. I mean, all that is, to me, it's of no consequence. What spiritual value? That, that, are they going to meet Jesus on Mars? I mean, I don't know. You know, what do they say? If, 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 if God meant us to fly, we'd have wings, you know, that type of thing. So that is why it's called Babel, because the Lord frustrated the plans of man, confused the language in the whole world, and from there, the Lord, God the Father, I believe, scattered them over the face of the whole earth. See, confusion is what happens when you walk out of the will of God. Where was your obedience to God? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others as yourself. I mean, they had contact with God, the Creator. But see, these, Babylon, these Babylonians you know, these, that created this, this tower... They wanted to be the gateway to God, the gateway to heaven. They were going to reach God. In fact, some inscriptions and some historical documentation that we have says that Nimrod wanted to attempt to frustrate God in case he ever changed his mind and wanted to flood the earth again. That he would have a big enough structure that he would be able to take refuge on the top of the Tower of Babel. Now, little does he know his arithmetic wasn't very good. Because if Nimrod knew, looked at Noah's log he'd know that the water from the flood was about 20 or 30 feet higher than the highest mountain, which was Mount Everest. And that was 30,000 feet. 300 feet, you're going to be under a lot of water. So that's the foolishness of man. You know, we think that we can do better than God. We don't need God. We are a God unto... New Age tells you this. You are a God unto yourself. You could make yourself... Be Listen, if you leave me to myself... I'm not going to get any better. I'm going to get a lot worse. Amen. Without Christ and without being forgiven and without being reconciled to God, I'm doomed. Yeah. And one needs to know that. And these people don't know that. They think that they can increase their knowledge and become like God. It will never happen. I'm going to end here. I'm going to, next week I'm going to get into the principles that we can learn from the Tower of Babel. Uh, next week I'll get into the practical application. I'll do a little bit of a re review and then I'll get into the practical application of this. But I wanna, I wanna share this with you because in, 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 see, we're trying to build the Tower of Babel as we speak. Man is trying to reach God and be their own God. And how might they try to do this? I don't know if you've ever heard of the God particle. Maybe you've heard of the God particle. But because I do a lot of research in physics and quantum mechanics and those types of things, let me share with you. See, humanity continues to try to ever expand and increase their knowledge and reach for the heavens and reach for God on their own terms. See, we can't reach God on our own terms. It's on his terms. And it's through his son. And that's the way it is. You can't enter the sheep gate through any other way. There's only one way in. There's one sheep gate in, and that's the only way to get in. And the shepherd knows the voice. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd. There's no fooling. So one example, I think, of trying to build the Tower of Babel in this day and age is an attempt to locate, locate the higgins boson particle, which is known as God's particle. Mm -hmm. What they're trying to do is they're trying to generate life. They built this big particle collider. And I believe it was built in, where's that built in? In Norway? But anyway, uh, there's this European organization for nuclear research built the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator 
the Large Hadron Collider. Out of this door might come something, or we might send something through it. What they're trying to do is trying to establish life in these particles. They're trying to be God. God is the only, I don't want to say, God is the only entity that could bring forth life. As hard as you try to bring forth life, and as much money as they spend on this large cauldron collider where they're throwing particles at astronomical rates of speed to try to form some type of life or try to get something to uh, exist that doesn't exist, what they're trying to do is they're trying to build a Tower of Babel. Man's mind has so much ability God gave us to think, to reason, to create. And when that gets used for non-God purposes, this is the result. And when you see the evil in the world, this is the result. So we need to take this story of the Tower of Babel and maybe take it more seriously and really challenge ourselves how are we living? Are we living for God? Are we doing everything we can for the glory of God? Nimrod didn't, and that's the result. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this Tower of Babel, this example that we can look at ourselves and see the mistakes that they've made in trying to accomplish things on their own outside of God. We thank you for today, Lord. Let us learn these principles, and let us learn that we are unable to do anything without you and without being in your will in our lives. We thank you for this in Jesus' name.